let you take this, the microphone now, um, uh, Brian, and tell, tell us what you're going to talk about and what, what, is, what is the future of, of banking and DeFi? Uh, well, uh, so Howard, th thanks for that. What I want to do is, um, I think, sort of situate a discussion of DeFi into a broader context of, of what is decentralization and crypto about in the first place. And, and the point I want to make here, the contention I want to advance, is that um, you know, DeFi is kind of the ultimate expression of what crypto is all about, really. And now is probably an easier time to understand that than almost any time uh, since, since the Bitcoin white paper was written more than 10 years ago for a bunch of reasons that I'm gonna get into. But let me just start before we go long on, on DeFi itself, let me just start and explain why I think banks need to care about uh, crypto and decentralization to begin with, and then what DeFi really looks like as, as an ultimate use case of, of crypto. So some of you who've, who've read any of my writing or have heard any prior talks will know that I've talked a lot about my thesis that there are two macro trends in the financial system that have been going on for a while. One started earlier than the other, but I think they both now together are the defining features of kind of the next generation of finance. And those trends that I've, I've written about before are unbundling and decentralization. And what I mean by unbundling is the idea that both consumers and investors um, have shown through their behavior that they find more value in receiving certain kinds of financial services on a standalone bespoke platform and not bundled with lots of other banking services. There's a lot of evidence for this. Um, if, if you wanted just the most uh, buzzy and visible uh, evidence for this, look at how hard Wells Fargo tried to force people to take bundles, right? That was what the original Wells Fargo scandal was about was people who showed up wanting a credit card found that they also had other accounts opened for them that they didn't even want. Uh, but the bank's business model was so desperate to have people in multiple products at the same time that they were willing to fraudulently put people in those products rather than sell them the one product that they wanted. So just start with that very visible example. But if you wanna look even more uh, compellingly about what unbundling was about, um, you can look, for example, at investor returns in monoline FinTech companies versus investor returns in comprehensive banks that also had businesses that were comparable to those delivered in monoline FinTech companies. And what you'll see is that the rate of return on FinTechs providing that service compared to on banks providing the same service is massively different, uh, massively different. And so for example, a payments company that does nothing but payments, take Stripe as an example, is a far higher growth company than the biggest bank that has the biggest payments business, which would be Bank of America. Um, that's true across all kinds of different businesses, whether it is consumer lending, where you compare the growth rate of SoFi to the growth rate of a consumer lending platform at a bank, or mortgage lending at uh, you know, any of the multiple fintech mortgage companies versus you know, the biggest banks that are engaged in that asset class. And so what that tells us is there's something about technology's ability to deliver only the service you want without the need to bolt it onto other funding sources uh, as happens at a bank that has led fintech to be a major, a major driver. Now, fintech and, and crypto are obviously not the same thing. But fintech and crypto at some level are solving similar kinds of things, which are inherent inefficiencies in the legacy banking system that only exist because at the time those banking business models were invented, there was no technically better way of, of, of performing that function. So let me just toggle then over to the concept of decentralization, which is really what we're talking about today. So if, if fintech is about saying that you don't have to keep your deposits at the same place that processes your payments, or you don't have to get your loan at the same place that you also keep your deposits, crypto is about saying for any given one of those things, you may not need an intermediary at all, whether the intermediary is a bank or whether the intermediary is a fintech company. What decentralization is all about is the idea that um, open source software can connect multiple different people who don't even know each other and allow them to essentially transact through an algorithm to achieve the financial goals that normally they needed some kind of human intermediation for. And so, you know, we all know the basic story of crypto. We know that, you know, essentially crypto tokens exist to power individual networks. We know that the value of crypto tokens generally reflects the rate of adoption of those networks and everything. Um, but as I'll say in a moment, you know, DeFi is the ultimate expression of all of that. So I want to start with the idea that there are these macro megatrends that are not going to go away 
that tell us technology will fundamentally disrupt the business of banking and banks will need to adapt or find their role, at least most banks will find their role significantly reduced and changed over the next generation, maybe not in the next two years, but certainly, uh, I think unquestionably in the next 20 years. So people who talk about crypto to bankers are generally met with the following kind of response. They're generally met with, I thought all crypto was about was either speculation on price or illicit activity. And I don't understand when people say crypto is an open financial system, what are they, what are they even talking about? Well, this is where DeFi comes in. You know, DeFi are that set of protocols that exist to do something that previously could only be done um, through an intermediary. So things like lending, for example, where you needed a pool of capital sitting in one location and you needed a credit officer to make judgments about how to deploy that capital, uh, for instance or you needed a payments processor to sit between your deposit account and your creditors who needed paying to decide exactly the most efficient way to move your money from account A to, to account B at the creditor. Open source software changes all of that, right? And so the concept of DeFi is that you don't actually need any intermediation at all if you have a network of computers running a set of software protocols that allow you to request what you need in the form of credit to allow somebody else to lend to you or to buy and sell stocks without an intermediary broker or, or whatever. So um, this turns out, I believe, to be the ultimate killer app of crypto. The, the ultimate killer app is crypto is doing banking. And the way that has to work is that there's a token uh, that is the native token of a DeFi protocol that people contribute onto that protocol. And the protocol then uses that and all of the other tokens that have been um, put in there to either make loans or transfer value through payments or, or do any of a series of other things that are directly analogous to what's going on in the banking system. They do all of that with essentially zero overhead, with no personnel, with no capacity for fraud because obviously the software is open source and people can see the code. Um, so, so all of those are things that lead me to conclude that DeFi will eventually become the preferred um, route for many, many kinds of financial transactions. Indeed, a lot of people who first were attracted to FinTech 10 years ago by the promise of peer-to-peer -peer marketplaces and peer-to-peer -peer lending uh, know that FinTech never fully delivered on that, that a lot of the companies that build themselves as peer-to-peer -peer weren't really peer-to-peer. -peer. You know, Lending Club had to provide its own liquidity and they had to have their own lending license and they had to do all kinds of things even though it was possible to invest in loans that were bundled by Lending Club and it was possible to take loans out from Lending Club funded by those pools. But at the end of the day, there was still an intermediary sitting there and that was Lending Club. In the world of DeFi, that won't be the case in the future. So there's a question about what that means for banks. And then there's also a question about what that means for the regulatory safety that we've most mostly taken for granted for in the banking or had taken for granted in the banking system over the last you know several generations. So this is why I wrote a Financial Times op-ed just a couple of months ago called Get Ready for Self-Driving Banks, where I asked the question, you know, is it possible to grant bank powers and to grant a bank charter to a software protocol? That's a weird idea because generally speaking, when the bank regulators grant a bank charter, they're granting the charter to a group of incorporators. So it's like these five men and women are the bank and they get the charter and they have to be there, they have to sit on the board of directors, et cetera. But why is that so? I mean, we, we do it that way because until now there's never been technology that allowed banking functions to be done without those kinds of human beings. But now we have software that does things that look a lot like banking and, uh, and perhaps don't actually need human beings to be there for the charter. And yet there are laws that govern what lenders can do and what payments companies can do. And the concept of some of these DeFi protocols don't fit neatly within our existing laws. So my suggestion was that rather than uh, cramping or clamping down on DeFi, we start thinking harder about what laws do we really need in a world where, um, where banking can be delivered without the risk of discrimination or the risk of fraud or whatever. And by the way, I realize all of these claims that I'm making are a little bit controversial. There are some people I, I'm guessing on the video who will say, hey, software can still discriminate or software can still have some sort of non-disclosure, so, so we should talk about that. Um, but uh, the question is, in a world where there aren't any human beings doing that, how do you think about regulation and supervision? My belief is that it will actually be easier to supervise these kinds of protocols than it is today to supervise human beings because human beings are always trying to cover their tracks and get away with things. This is why historically in banking regulation, we have funny traditions like 
for example, requiring certain bank employees to take a certain amount of vacation every year so that some other employee will sit on their desk and presumably discover if there was something nefarious going on. You don't have that problem with software. And you know, if you could have bank examiners plugging in directly to the underlying code and identifying bugs and understanding why it is that these kinds of people are getting loans and those kinds of people aren't, or why it is that these kinds of prices are being observed in a DeFi marketplace or whatever, you could recommend changes to the code directly without needing to worry about incentivizing a manager at a bank to respond to your, to your MRA or whatever. So to me, these are all the big questions that come down the pike. Um, uh, how do we make sure that there's safety and soundness in a world of self-driving banks, right? It's the same problem that highway traffic regulators uh, think about when they think about protecting the public from self-driving cars who on the one hand don't get drunk and on the other hand do have software glitches, right? So there's a different set of risks that have to be managed. Uh, but the reason we migrate in that direction is because the biggest risks are the risks of human error and human corruption. And if we can solve those risks, then presumably it's gonna be easier to deal with some of these other kinds of things that we'll see in, in a world enabled by DeFi. Now let's just talk for a moment about where, whether DeFi is yet a real threat to the traditional financial system. I'm gonna argue that it is not yet, but that the rate of growth of DeFi is so fast that if I were a bank CEO, I would wanna understand this and find a way to be relevant sooner rather than later. So when I wrote my self-driving banks op-ed just a couple of months ago, the total dollar amount that had been contributed to DeFi tokens in these protocols at that time was something like 16 or $17 billion, if memory serves. That number, only a couple of months later, is well more than double that figure, which is how you know that, uh, as in, with everything in tech, it's about the rate of increase, not the absolute size. So at this rate, you know, DeFi protocols will be in the hundreds of billions and, and even larger magnitudes within just a few years. And if you think about the fact that the entire national banking system consists of only $15 trillion of assets, and DeFi has gone from zero to 40-ish billion dollars of assets in the space of two or three months, that tells you something about uh, why we need to take this seriously. My prediction is that at the end of the day, banks will increasingly migrate as other professional service providers have to higher value add services. They'll realize that it's not a tenable business model to simply be a rent collector uh, on a value chain. And what they'll want to do is start migrating to things where they can add real value. So examples of where this has happened um, include, for example, when TD and Charles Schwab and Robinhood eliminated trading commissions because they realized that in a world of online trading, there was just no way to defend charging people a 2% commission for the privilege of allowing them onto your website to click sell on a stock trade. And so they, th those went to zero. And what those services now focus on are delivering advice, making forecasts, engaging in wealth management and discretionary activities and other things where they really add value versus just collecting tolls. That's, I think, one of the incentives that DeFi will create in the traditional financial system is taking away the opportunities to just be toll collectors and making it much more likely that uh, the banking system, though it may be smaller uh, in some ways in headcount, will still exist as a value add, not just as a friction in the system. So there's good and there's bad, Howard, when it comes to DeFi. Um, I think that there is, however, an inevitability about it, which means that it's not about whether it's good or bad. You know, We can debate if the internet's good or bad, but the nature of networks is such that they will eat the world, as Mark Andreessen said 30 years ago. And the time now is to get ready for that and anticipate it, not to debate whether we want it. So let me go ahead and leave it there. I know that we've got a panel coming up and a lot of other things to talk about. But uh, I'll, I'll just say I'm super optimistic about this future. I think the idea of tearing down barriers, reducing fees, and allowing more access is a great thing for the industry. And it's something that blockchain is going to be, I think, uh, a driver of. So, Brian, I'm going to um, ask the panel to join in one second. But I want to just ask you one quick question before we let you join the panel. Um, and that is, if you could venture to make some predictions about how all of this is going to unfold on the competitive landscape in the next few years, because you, know, you can see several different possible scenarios. One is that the traditional banks and other financial institutions adapt and build up these capacities internally, or they acquire this capacity externally, or that you have these new incumbents or new uh, insurgents rather come in and grow so quickly as, as was um, mentioned earlier today, I mean, I, someone said that the market cap of Coinbase potentially now is, is $100 billion. 
so that they get so big that they can't be acquired and that they actually become like the Teslas of the um, financial markets um, and um, overwhelm the traditional institutions. I, how, would you like to make a prediction on what scenarios are gonna be likely? Well, um, you know, there's there's sort of a short, medium and long-term prediction here. And, and I think we should start with the long-term prediction and reverse engineer from that. Right. So if any of what I just said is true, um, if 50% of what I just said is true, institutions will become increasingly less relevant over time, right? Uh, if, if you take Coinbase as an example, my former employer, who I'm very close to and have, have a lot of affection for, Coinbase, you know, yeah, among real crypto believers has often been seen as kind of, kind of uh, you know, heterodox in that they're the centralized institution for decentralized assets, right? And the way that I always thought about Coinbase when I worked there was, look, Coinbase's current business model is not its permanent business model. Today, Coinbase is the on-ramp for people to get into crypto, right? To get into a world where you don't need centralized institutions. And at the moment, you know, we still need on and off ramps because if you buy Bitcoin and make a lot of money and you want to sell it, and that's a, that's a thing you should never do, right? But uh, let's say that you're one of those people who are trading Bitcoin as opposed to just hodling Bitcoin. Um, you need a place to go sell it. And Coinbase is where you do that. So Coinbase exchanges fiat for crypto and they exchange crypto for fiat. But there will come a day when nobody's going to want to offboard into fiat anymore. There will come a day. And indeed, there are already countries in the world today, the Venezuelas and Zimbabwe's and hyperinflationary parts of the world, where nobody does want to offboard into fiat, at which point it won't make any difference that Coinbase is big or not, because the underlying economic activity is now happening on blockchain. So you need to prepare for a world where the institutions are not relevant in the way they're relevant today, where you don't need Visa to transmit your payment, or you don't need Coinbase to access your crypto. You only need Coinbase to migrate from fiat into crypto. Once you're in crypto and have a wallet, you can do anything you want on blockchain without need for the exchange. And, and that's, I think, the future. Banks have lived with their model for like 500 years. That's the weird part. But Coinbase and exchanges like them, they will migrate to become platforms for DeFi uh, protocols. They'll become incubators for new tokens. They'll, they'll do all of those things. But the exchange model, sort of like at Robinhood, you know, uh, at some level, collecting fees for exchange business will, will go away.